Uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, learning vectorial representations for words. So these are the acknowledgements slash references for where I have, the things that I have referred to while preparing for this lecture. Uh, so you can just go over these. Uh, some of these are also available as video lectures on YouTube. You can take a look at them also. Uh, in the first module, we are going to look at uh, one hot representations of words. Okay. So as usual, we'll start with this motivation or motivation uh, motivating question. Uh, why do we need to learn representations for words? Okay. Vectorial representations. I mean, words are there, right? You can write them using alphabets and characters and so on. So why do we need vectorial representations of based on whatever you have seen so far in the course? I have not seen anything in the course. Okay, let's see. So suppose we are given an input stream of words, right? It could be a sentence or a document. And right? if I say document, it pretty much covers uh, almost all the text that you see, right? You can always abstract everything as a document. An email is also a document. Manuals are also documents and so on, right? And we are interested in learning some function of it, right? So I'm given a document and I'm interested in the function y hat. Say y hat is equal to sentiments of the words in the document or the sentiment of the document itself, right? This is imaginable, this is not something that I'm cooking up, this is something that you would want to do, you would like want to, for example, if you're a movie maker, you would want to know once the movie is released, people have written reviews about it, what is the sentiment, is it positive or negative. Similarly, if Apple has released a new product or a new feature, it would want to know what are the reviews written about this product and what's the feature, what's the sentiment coming out of this, right, it's positive or negative, right. Now sentiment is a binary thing or it could be rated also, right? It could be on a scale of 1 to 10 also, but let's consider it's binary, that either people liked it or did not like it. So now I'm trying to learn this function, which gives me, which takes as input words, but as output gives me real numbers, either 0 to 1 or on a scale of 1 to 10 or whatever, right? And this is not something that we have dealt with in the course so far, right? How do we take as input words? So our inputs have already always been uh, numbers, right? They were either, either coming from R, N, or they were coming from 0 to 1 raised to N, or something of that sort, right? We never had the situation where we have words as inputs, right? So now, how do we deal with this situation? And also, I made a case for that learning this function is a valid thing to do. You have several use cases where you will need this, okay? So now, if we employ a machine learning algorithm, that's some mathematical model. So we saw that we could have several such models, logistic regression, SVM, and neural networks, and uh, feed forward neural networks and so on, right? And at the end, we are trying to learn this function y hat is equal to f of x. But in our case, the x instead of have be, uh, instead of x being numbers, it turns out that x is actually a collection of words, right? So now, how do we reconcile with the situation where we have suddenly have words instead of numbers, right? So the way to do that would be, we need a way of converting these words or documents into some number, into some vectorial representation. And once we have this vectorial representation, right, so now we have our r raised to n. And we know how to deal with r raised to n. Given r raised to n, how to predict r or even r square or r m in general, that we know, right. We can design neural networks or any other machine learning algorithms to do that, right. So, but how do we go from here to here? That's the question. Right? And that's why we need to learn vectorial representations of words. Is the motivation clear to everyone? Okay. Now, let's start getting with the nitty gritties of how to do that. Right? So, now we'll start hearing this word corpus. Have you heard this word before? That's exactly what you're collecting for the word to wake assignment. Right? You're collecting a corpus in specific languages. And I've taken a very toyish corpus for the purpose of illustration. So, here is a corpus which just contains four sentences. Right? So, Think of it that I have a very restricted domain and a very small set of documents and I just have these four sentences with me. This is a valid corpus. The corpus that you are constructing is probably much larger scale. You are trying to collect 100,000 sentences or 50,000 sentences or something of that order, right? Uh, but we will take this toy example. Now consider the set V of all unique words across all these input streams. Right? So I will just call them input streams. By input streams I mean sentences or documents or whatever, right? You could take it as any sequence of uh, words. And V is a set of all unique words across all this input sentences that you have, okay? So can you tell me what V is here? What would, can you tell me some elements of V, of the set V? Human, machine, interface and so on, right? So in fact, this is the entire set V, which is written on the uh, left-hand side, right? 
and V is called the vocabulary of the corpus. So that means everything in the corpus comes from this vocabulary. All sentences are constructed by arranging words from this vocabulary. Okay. Some of you might always I mean find this very trivial, but I am just going over the basics so that at least the terminology is clear to everyone. And what we want is a representation for every word in V. So that is the title of the lecture, learning vectorial representations of words. So for every word in our vocabulary, whatever corpus we are dealing with, the vocabulary would change. And for every word there, we want to learn a representation for that word. So that is what our quest is today. Okay. And now one very simple way of doing this is right, you tell me okay, you want a vector, right? that is all you care about, here is a vector, I will give you one hot representations. So if the total number of words in my vocabulary is V, I will just construct a vector of size V okay? and I will assign a number to every word in my vocabulary. Right? So I will say human is equal to 0, machine is equal to 1, interface is equal to 2 and so on. And now if you ask me for a vectorial representation of that word, I will just say take this vector of size V and switch on the corresponding bit and everything else would be 0, hence 1 hot. Right? At any given point of time only one of the elements in the vector would be on. Okay, so that is the simple one hot representation and there is a very simple recipe to get a vectorial representation of words and for every word in your vocabulary. Now what is the drawback of this? Uh, v tends to be very large, right? so for example there is a standard corpus known as the pen tree bank corpus which is used in various NLP applications for various reasons and that corpus has a vocabulary of 50k. Google of course operates at its own scale, so they have a 1T corpus which has 13 million words. Right? So this is like all the most of the web pages which they have crawled and constructed a vocabulary from that. So now I am talking about for every word representing it by a vector of size 13 million, clearly does not work, right? I mean this is too much of storage required for that. And if you look at it, the information in it is so redundant, right? it is all zeros except for that one bit which is on. Okay? And the other important problem is that these representations do not capture any notion of similarity. Of the three words that I have shown you, which two do you want to have similar representations? Cat and dog. Why? Because both of them are domestic animals, right? both of them are mammals. So there are some things that you would want at least at the minimum that the similarity between a cat and dog is more than the similarity between cat and truck or alternately the distance between cat and dog is less than the distance between cat and truck. So now once I start talking about vectors, I can talk about similarities like cosine similarities or I can start talking about Euclidean distances. Right? Once anything I convert it to a vector, I can start asking these questions. And the two questions which I am asking are valid. Right? What would you expect to be the Euclidean distance between cat and dog as compared to cat and truck? Now what happens with the one hot representations? Take any two words in your corpus, any two, what will be their Euclidean distance? what will it be? Square root of 2, right? for all the words. Okay? Take any two words in your corpus, what will their cosine similarity be? 0, because all these vectors are orthogonal. Right? So their cosine similarity is going to be 0. Now this is, that means these vectors are not really capturing any information about the essence of the word. Right? See so remember always we are interested, even like this has been our philosophy right from auto encodes and so on right? or even principal component analysis, we are always interested in learning meaningful representations which capture something fundamental about the entity that we are trying to represent. Right? But here something like that is clearly not happening. Okay? So that is not acceptable. 